Grace. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Grace Church. It's good to have you. And those who are out in the lobby, hello to you. <clears throat> we hope you'll come in and join us, all right? Plenty of chairs around here to sit in. So, hey, let's uh, start with a word of prayer. Can we all stand together, please, as we open up the service this morning? Our gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for this precious day to worship you. God, I thank you that uh, Donna Shay could be with us today to worship the Lord. Thank you uh, for watching over her. Thank you that Mark Couples is with us today as well. And uh, we thank you for what you're doing in their lives and how you're helping them each and every day through the trials they are, they are going through. We pray for those who are home and sick today that you touch their bodies and restore their health. And God, I thank you for the privilege to worship Jesus. We love you. You are worthy of all worship. You deserve it all. And I pray we would <clears throat> express our love and praise to you this day. And in Jesus' precious name, amen. Hey, the worship band's going to start playing. We want you to turn around and you can wave at somebody, knuckle bump, say hi, whatever, but <laughs> greet someone today. Standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises that cannot fail. When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail. I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing. Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leading on the everlasting arms. What a blessing there. What a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. I'm leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. I'm leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? All your garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Yes, I'm standing, standing, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God. Yes, I'm standing, standing, standing on the promises of God. Good morning, Grace Church. Welcome back, brother. I see you're wearing that same shirt that everybody else wore. So. 
<laughs> there you go. Amen. Praise the Lord. So good to see you back. Don, it's good to see you back too, sister. so safe and you don't need us but you want us and I thank you for that and you love us through everything and you're in control and I love you and in Jesus name amen amen, amen. amen. Thank you, sister. Good for all right you're welcome to sit stand however you want to do it if you pray if you want to stand that's fine it's all good so <laughs> good. 
We're up four, right? Yeah. yeah. I don't have it written down. Okay. Okay. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness. New every morn. Since they are made, His mercy is more. Are we done? Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 we can be. <laughs>
I'm out of the rhythm today. I'll just, just before we go to the next song, let me just tell you about my morning. I came to church thinking I was wearing black pants today. Once I got in the light, I found out, figured out I had blue pants on, and I had a shirt that totally clashed what I had on. So I had to call Cheryl. She brought in a shirt so I could change this morning, just so I could be up here and match, okay? <laughs> so anyways, guys, thank you so much for letting me interrupt your, your time of worship here. I'm just gonna go sit down. You were welcome to join us, I'm just saying. I mean, if you really want to come up and sing, I mean. Take it all, take it all, my 
Amen. Amen. Aren't you glad we have a pastor who's just raring to go? Amen. <laughs> that song was worth waiting on. Amen, brother. Amen, brother. So, hey, I'm going to ask Kaylee Withers to come on up. Kaylee, you probably not. Yeah, we talked. Come on up, Kaylee. I'm, let me just kind of tell you a little bit about Kaylee. I've known Kaylee for 16 years, and <clears throat> she's been coming to church this, that long. I've watched her. Uh, grow in the Lord, come to know Christ as her Savior, and just watch her mature in her faith, and uh, she's getting ready to go to the mission field. So I'd like Kayla just come share a little bit of what she's getting ready to do. I graduated last year with a degree in Applied Linguistics uh, from Moody Bible Institute. Um, and I now have the opportunity to go to Japan and teach English as a missionary with the Shukugawa Bible Church. Uh, the church was founded in 1970 and is in Nishinomiya, which is between Kobe and Osaka. Uh, the English ministry is a major part of their outreach. Uh, and many of their staff, including their pastor, began learning about the Bible through these lessons. Um, currently about one to one and a half percent of the population in Japan is Christian and for many these lessons are their first exposure that they've ever had to Christianity. Um, as a missionary English teacher I'll be responsible for preparing and teaching around 16 classes a week uh, for all ages from young children to seniors um, as well as serving on Sundays and helping with other outreach ministries. I also plan to minister to those who live in isolation um, and uh, I am currently studying Japanese language and uh, preparing to go. I leave on Tuesday morning pretty early. Um, yeah. And it's just, I also wanted to thank you because I wouldn't have been able to go to Moody in the first place without uh, your guidance and your recommendation to go. And just, uh, it was also on our, the Mexico trip that I really felt like I could go into do, into missions and why I even wanted to go to Moody in the first place. So Amen. really thankful for that. Amen. Don't go yet, Kaylee, because <clears throat> Amen. I'm gonna ask uh, our elders to come on up. Guys, would you please come up and we're gonna we're gonna pray for you and and just I'm gonna have the congregation pray as well as we uh, dedicate and commission you as you're being sent out from Grace Church to go into the harvest. Amen. Mm -hmm. I think of Matthew 28, 19, 20, go into all the world and preach the gospel and baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always to the ends of the earth. And we're sending Kaylee out in, in obedience to that great commission that Jesus has given the church. And, and we're, we're excited to see how God is going to use you and your training in linguistics and, and languages, and, and, and God's going to use that to, to help you reach the Japanese people for Christ. I think that's awesome. And um, I'm excited. And amen. Praise God. Amen. Praise the Lord. So I'm going to ask one of our elders in particular, just to, Phil, I'm going to want you just to, you've known Kaylee for a long time. And... Uh, mm -hmm. Phil's going to have a special prayer. We're going to pray with, pray for you. So, guys, let's pray. Can Can you say anything in Japanese yet? Um, I can introduce myself. Well, go ahead. All right. Um, say okay. it loud so we don't. Wow, hear. now I'm nervous. Ohayo gozaimasu. Watashi wa Kaylee des. Sorry. I'm it's all right. It's okay. Woohoo! Yoshiko onegashimasu. That is awesome. Good job. <laughs> all right. You know I had to put her on the spot there, yeah. right? Yeah. I was like forgetting all the Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's have a word of prayer, okay? Glorious Father in heaven, uh, what a blessing it is um, to see uh, Kaylee uh, taking this next step. And God, you know, uh, we've watched her grow over the years, and it's just been an amazing journey. And I just want to thank you for allowing us to be a part of her journey as well. And God, we know that uh, her heart uh, is for you, and we've known it actually since she 
since she went on the missions uh, to Mexico, because she had mentioned before that it just felt like it was it was uh, right up her alley. But God, I want to thank you for allowing her to go to uh, Japan and giving her the support and the direction to do so. More so than that, the heart to serve you in that capacity so that others can come to know you. And God, we know that she is going to be a great light because your light shines through her. And I just thank you so much for the opportunity to lift her up in prayer. And I pray that as a congregation that we continue to lift her up in prayer and that we continue to support her. And God, that um, you uh, protect her and uh, love her, uh, give her strength as, as she's away. And God, we look forward to hearing uh, reports back uh, for her. And we just thank you again for allowing us the opportunity to love on her in a, in a, in a means of prayer. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. Thank you. And Kaylee, um, one more thing. I can speak Japanese. Oh, yeah? Sushi. (laughs) Very good. That's pretty good, isn't it? Hey, we're going to be uh, supporting Kaylee uh, each month. That's what I didn't tell you yet. We're going to be supporting each month. And uh, the church is covering her airfare to get to Japan. And I want to thank you for your faithful giving and, and support of missions here in this church, which has enabled us to be able to do that. And it's exciting. And Kaylee has some prayer cards. Are you going to have those out in the lobby? Yeah. All right. And there's, there's going to be a meet and greet after church in the lobby. You can meet Kaylee if you haven't had a chance to talk with her yet or don't know her that well. And also we'll have some, I think, walking tacos um, and uh, some some food prepared so you guys don't have to worry about lunch and you can hang out out there in the lobby and and we certainly hope you will and enjoy some time with Kaylee and her family. God bless you, Kaylee. Let's give her a hand, all right? Awesome. Thanks, guys. I wanted our kids, before we dismissed our kids to the edge, I wanted them to see Kaylee and hear what she had to say because our prayer has been to make disciples here and to see kids know the Lord and watch them grow and commit their lives to God. And uh, we hope to see more people from our church go in the mission field down the road as God uh, sets them apart and calls them for that task. Amen. Kids, we're going to let you go to the edge, uh, K through 5th. Listen well to Miss Cheryl. And uh, she teaches you today. All right. I wish I had a little bit of their energy. That'd be great. I want to show you a picture up here on the screen as we get ready to start Revelation chapter 7. Not that, that picture right there. This is uh, a picture that was taken back in 1944. The gentleman's name is Raoul Wallenberg. He was a Swedish diplomat who traveled to Budapest, Budapest, Hungary. He had a strong desire to Uh, protect Hungarian Jews who had ties to Sweden. Hitler was murdering Jews at an increased rate, and so Ryu created documents and official-looking stamps and crest, and then he distributed those to many Jewish people, as many as he could. He also established soup kitchens and hospitals, and employed Jewish people to work in them. He relocated many Jews to areas that flew the Swedish flag. Ryu was also responsible for intercepting Jews who were being transported to death camps. He provided them with protective passports. Folks, his heroism saved the lives of over 100,000 Jews. One guy... And using his efforts and his abilities, uh, really rescuing many, many people, 100,000 Jews at least. He inspired other countries who were neutral to be more active and aggressive in rescuing Jewish people, uh, as many Jewish people as they could. When the Russians liberated Budapest, Raoul was arrested on suspicion of being a spy. He was incarcerated, and he died in 1947. 
I look at that man, I see a guy of courage, guy who is courageous, selfless, and willing to risk it all to rescue the Jewish people. And I'm sure that his efforts and his sacrifice uh, was appreciated by those 100,000 Jews who were rescued from death. But I'm not here to talk to you all about Raul. He's an illustration this morning leading into a greater deliverer. Amen? And that deliverer is Jesus Christ, who is on a continual mission of rescuing the perishing. How many have been rescued by Jesus in this room? Just raise your hand. Can we just give the Lord applause and praise? Amen? And thank the Lord for rescuing our soul from an eternity in hell. Because that's what we all deserve. Matter of fact, there's a song called Rescue the Perishing and Care for the Dying. And I don't know, John, if we have that at all. If you could, I don't know if there's any way to pull that up and have it ready at the end of the service. I mean, what's that? Uh, Rescue the Perishing. And uh, maybe we can sing that song at the very end of the service today. But the Lord has been rescuing people. Uh, he is rescuing people today. Uh, he'll rescue more people in the future. And he's even going to rescue people during that seven-year tribulation period. We kind of left off with the sealed judgments being released on the inhabitants of the world. God is judging the Jewish nation. He's judging Gentiles. During this time, there's worldwide deception from the Antichrist. Death and destruction are everywhere. But all through this tribulation period, God is rescuing multitudes of people, Jew and Gentile alike, people from every nation, and delivering them from a time of judgment. Now, we've already looked at several seals. The first seal, of course, was the white horse with a rider who had no bow depicting the Antichrist who brings false peace. The second seal was a rider on a red horse depicting war. The third seal is a rider on a black horse representing famine. The fourth seal is a rider on a pale horse who represents death and Hades. And we know that by the time the fourth seal is complete, a quarter of the population of the world at that time will die just from those first four seals that will be unleashed on the population of the world. Statisticians tell us that about 8 billion people will be in the, are, are going to be uh, in this world by the end of this year. So if you can imagine this happening at this time, that would be about 2 billion people dying just in the first three and a half years of the tribulation period. The fifth seal revealed the souls of believers martyred during the early part of the tribulation because of the word of God and their testimony for Jesus Christ. The sixth seal is broken and there's a great earthquake and the sun turns black as sackcloth and the whole moon turns blood red. And now we are in an interlude here in Revelation chapter 7 just before the seventh seal is broken and released. And during this interlude, we are introduced to the 144,000 Jews and to martyrs of the Great Tribulation, the second half of the Tribulation period. But I want to remind us all here that both groups were rescued by the Lord. And God rescued those 144,000 Jews. Then he sent them on a mission. And they're going, to be, they're going to be going all over the world during those seven-year tribulation period. They're going to be sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. And, and those who believe will be rescued. They may die. They will die physically, but they're going to be rescued eternally uh, through the love of Jesus Christ and his great salvation. Now, the Apostle John was on the island of Patmos. He was used by God to write the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. And now, towards the, the end of his life, he's writing the book of Revelations. He's up in years, and 
He's writing of the things to come in Revelation 1.1. So let's pray before we go any further. Father, I just pray now as we, we dissect the Scripture this morning and evaluate Your truth. And then, Lord, have some application for our own life today. I pray, God, that this would be a time of learning, but not just a time of acquiring some knowledge, but a time of growing, a time of evaluating, a time of changing, a time of uh, reprioritizing uh, our life. Lord, if there's anybody in this room or anybody watching online who does not know beyond a shadow of a doubt where they're going to spend eternity one day, my prayer today, dear Holy Spirit, is that you grab a hold of their heart, convict them of their sins, convince them of their need for Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray you'd save them. We ask this in Jesus' name. When all God's people said, amen. amen. Notice first of all, number one on your notes, John had a vision of the 144,000 Jews. In this vision, John saw some angels, and notice that letter A, these angels were positioned to release judgment. Look at verse one. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or on the sea or on any tree. That little phrase, first of all, let's start with after this. That phrase refers back to the previous passage, Revelation 6, which spoke of uh, the sixth sealed judgment that has now ended. And of course, I just mentioned the great earthquake, the sun turning black, the whole moon turning red, and that sealed judgment has passed now. And after this, John continues with this vision of four angels standing at the four corners of the earth. Now we know angels were created by God. They not only serve the needs of those who are redeemed, Hebrews 1.14, they are also used by God to carry out judgment. Um, give you an example, real quick one. God delivered King Hezekiah and the people of Judah from the army of Sennacherib. Look at 2 Kings 19.35 on your scripture sheet there. That night the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 in the Assyrian camp. And when the people got up the next morning, there were all the dead bodies. God delivered the people of Judah, delivered Hezekiah, and Sennacherib went back to Nineveh with with his tail between his legs and his own sons cut him down when he got there to his homeland. In Revelation 8, Revelation 9, chapter 11, chapter 16, chapter 18, chapter 19, we find angels being used by God to deliver judgment upon the world. These angels are at the four corners of the earth, north, south, east, and west. And they're holding back the winds from blowing. In Scripture, the four winds are associated with judgment in Scripture. Here's a passage to look up. You can look up Jeremiah 49, 36 on your own time and Daniel 7, 2. Just to give you an example, but these four winds denote judgment and these angels are holding back judgment. And the idea is a, the strong winds are straining to break free from the restraint you ever held a toddler in your arms that wanted to go play and they didn't want to sit in your lap? I had that happen the other day with one of the grandchildren. They're squirming all over the place. Let, let, let me loose. And that's kind of the idea here. The wind is, 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 is wanting to break free, but these angels are restraining it. They're restraining a judgment. Think about this. All over the world, there'll be no wind, no breeze. No waves crashing into the shoreline and no movement of the clouds. Everything all over the world is completely still and calm just before the storm. These angels were positioned to release judgment. But let it be, these angels were prevented from sending judgment. God is sovereign and God has a time for everything. Everything has to fall into place and look at verse 2 here. Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. You ought to circle the word another because it literally means another of the same kind. This is another powerful angel that God is using like the first four angels already mentioned. 
And what did this angel say to the first four angels? Verse 3, do not harm the land, the sea, or the trees. During the trumpet judgments, which are in, included in the seventh seal judgment, and the bold, seven bold judgments, the land and the seas and the trees will be destroyed. So the question is, why were these four angels temporarily prevented from unleashing the seventh seal judgment on the world? That leads us to letter C. The angels were to place a protective seal on the 144,000. And these 144,000 Jews will be protected by God. And look at verse 3 again. Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Kings and officials used rings. I've got a ring on. I've noticed sometimes some folks here have a ring that has the design on it. Maybe it's a class ring. Um, I had my class ring for one month until I lost it. And, uh, you know, maybe you, got a, maybe you won a Super Bowl and you got a Super Bowl ring. Do we have any Super Bowl players here? I don't think so. But anyways, you have a ring and there's an emblem on it, okay? And, and kings and officials often would wear have a ring and it had a seal on of authority and they would they would put it in a wax and or they would stamp it in the wax with that ring and, and they put it on documents and other items. The seal had their crest or their in, insignia plastered into the wax, showing their authority and their ownership of the document and for protection that nobody would break the seal and, and peek into the contents that weren't intended for them to read. It was common in John's time that slave owners uh, would also have a seal or a brand on their forehead or on their hand to declare the ownership, who that slave belonged to, so that no one would, would take that slave as their own slave. And it was for the protection of that slave. What was the seal that the Lord had, the, had his angels put on the foreheads of the 144,000 Jews? Here it is in verse 1 of Romans or Revelation chapter 14. Then I looked, and there before me was the Lamb, standing on Mount Zion, and with him the 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. That's the seal. They were sealed with God's name on their forehead. God will save and protect 144,000 Jewish male servants of the Lord. And they will serve God during the time of the tribulation period. Now, there's going to be many other Jews and Gentiles alike that will believe during the tribulation period. And there'll be no, this, none of this easy, hey, I'm just going to trust Jesus and keep living my life the way I'm living it. There'll be none of that. You trust Jesus in the tribulation period and you will pay with your life. So those who get saved during the tribulation period will mean business with God and they will be committed to Christ and they will reject that mark of the beast and they will lose their life. So there will be many other Jews that will be saved, many Gentiles, and they'll be martyred for their faith in Christ. But these special servants of the Lord will come through the horrific time of the tribulation period unscathed because God is supernaturally protecting their lives. This is nothing new. God protected people all the way throughout Scripture. He protected His children. The Lord didn't send a worldwide flood until Noah and his family were safe in the ark. Genesis chapter 7, verse 1. Actually, you can read the whole chapter. The Lord did not send the fiery judgment on Sodom until Lot and his family were escorted from the city of Sodom by the angels, Genesis 19. The firstborn Jewish people were protected from death because of the lamb's blood that was applied to the sides of the door and the top of the door frames, Exodus 12, 7. The Lord sent judgment on the people in Jericho, but Rahab and her family were spared because she tied the scarlet cord in her window and because her family stayed in her house. Joshua 2, 17 through 19. God will seal these 144,000 Jews. They will serve the Lord throughout the whole horrible tribulation period. 
and they will be protected by God from the Antichrist and from the Antichrist's cronies. By the way, the Antichrist will also seal his followers. All those who reject Christ will receive the mark of the beast, 666, and we'll cover that in the future, Revelation 13, Revelation 14. Number two, the 144,000 Jews are selected by God. Verse four, then I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from eat from all the tribes of Israel. 12,000 will be called out from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. Say, so Pastor Dan, I thought the tribes were lost. You know, at the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, all the records were destroyed. You know, I thought they were all lost. God knows where every Jew is at. Amen? He knows what tribe they came from. He knows where they live, how long they'll live, what they're doing when they sit, when they rise, what they're thinking, what they're going to say before they speak a word. He knows everything about them. So we can't, don't get all upset about that. God knows exactly what's cooking. He knows where they're at. This group by no means represents all the Jews but rather a group of Jews that God has called to minister, as I already mentioned, during the tribulation period. One scholar wrote that there is no standard way of listing the 12 tribes of Israel. There are at least 19 different ways of listing the tribes in the Old Testament, and none of them match this list that is given right here in Revelation chapter 7. Let's kind of walk through this fairly quick, but look at verse 5. From the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. From the tribe of Reuben, 12,000. From the tribe of Gad, 12,000. You might wonder, why isn't Reuben listened first since he's the oldest of Jacob's sons? Some scholars believe he's, that he's not listed first because he forfeited his birthright because of his sin with his father's concubine. 1 Chronicles 5, 1 through 2. Judah is mentioned first, perhaps, because Jesus came uh, through the tribe of Judah. Genesis 49, verse 10. Also notice that the tribe of Dan is not mentioned in this genealogy or in this list here. Scholars believe that this tribe was omitted because of their heavy involvement in idolatry. More than the rest of Israel, golden calves were set up in the town of Dan and in Bethel. You can read about that in Judges 17 through 18. Now, God's word really doesn't tell us why the tribe of Dan is omitted in this list. But that is certainly some interesting thoughts. Revelation 7, 6, from the tribe of Asher, 12,000. From the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000. From the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000. One of Joseph's sons are mentioned here. Look at Revelation 7, 7. From the tribe of Simeon, 12. And from the tribe of Levi, which is not normally listed in, 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 the, in the list of 12 sons here, but here he's listed. And the tribe of Issachar. From the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000. The tribe of Joseph, 12,000. From the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000. God's word doesn't tell us why the tribe of Ephraim is not mentioned, but again, many believe because of idolatry mentioned in Hosea 4.17. Some believe the tribe of Ephraim and the tribe of Dan will not experience protection uh, through that tribulation period. But we do see these tribes mentioned in the millennial reign of Christ, Ezekiel chapter 48. Read through that chapter and you'll see uh, Dan and Ephraim mentioned. Look at number three. 144,000 Jews will be consecrated unto God. They're described in Revelation 14 again at the very end of the tribulation period when Christ returns to earth. It reads in verse 4, these are those who did not defile themselves with women. We just park it right there for a minute. Now, God puts a high standard on moral purity, amen? He really does. God can also take care of the past of someone who's not been morally pure. He can forgive and cleanse and, and give people a fresh start and and and. Aren't you thankful today that God's a God of second, third, and fourth chances? Amen. God forgives. But here, these guys did not defile themselves with women. They kept themselves pure. They followed the Lamb wherever He goes. There's holiness and purity in life, and there's power in their ministry and effectiveness for the kingdom. 
They did not commit spiritual adultery during the tribe period, during the tribulation period. They did not take the mark of the beast. They did not worship the image of the Antichrist that's going to be set up in the Jewish temple. They were devoted solely to the Lord, and, and they spread the gospel all over the world. God originally sh- chose the Jews to be witnesses to share the good news with all the people all around the world. Isaiah 42 and verse 6 and Isaiah 43 and verse 10. Look on your notes though. Isaiah 42, 6 says, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles. We know the Jews failed at that task when they rejected their own Messiah. But during the future tribulation, these 144,000 Jews who believe in Jesus Christ as Savior and Messiah will fulfill the mandate from God and witness for the Lord all over the world. All the Gentiles will hear the gospel of Christ. And they will remain morally pure, living, holy lives. Some scholars believe they will be celibate, that they will not marry during the tribulation Uh, especially since the last three and a half years are extremely intense. Number four, the 144,000 Jews are called the first fruits to God. Look at verse four again of Revelation 14. They were purchased from among men and offered as first fruits to to God and the Lamb, to the Father and to the Son. Those converted Jews precede many other Jews who will believe during the tribulation, especially at the second coming of the Lord when he returns to earth and Israel, the Jewish people see the one who they who they slew. They realize he's their Messiah and they'll mourn. And the nation will be converted to Christ. Number five, the hundred and forty four thousand Jews speak the truth. Look at verse five again. No lie was found in their mouths, and they are blameless. Revelation 14, 5. The Antichrist will display false wonders and multitudes of people will be deceived by his lies. He's energized by the father of lies, Satan himself, John 8, 44. You don't have this scripture, but you can write it down. 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 and 10. The coming of the lawless one, that's the Antichrist, will be in accordance with the work of Satan, displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders, and every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. These 144,000 Jews will minister during a time of unparalleled lies and deception and they will speak the truth. By the way, we are living in a time of lies and deception, aren't we? Every day we hear the lies propagated on our news stations. Some of you students hear lies at school. You hear lies at work. You may have a friend trying to influence you with lies. I think all of us have to be careful whose voice we're listening to, amen? Because Satan is a liar. And he knows how to plant people in our life to lead us astray. That's why every one of us need to be reading God's word, which is truth, amen? Get the truth in your mind, saturate your mind with it so you can detect a lie. When someone's lying to you and trying to deceive you, you can can unveil that scheme and that strategy of the evil one with God's truth. Guard the doctrine and guard your life and guard your mind, guard your heart with the truth of God. I'm not mad, I'm just passionate, okay? So don't, I'm not going to come off the platform. Look at the word blameless there, uh, the word used for sacrificial animals without defect. These 144,000 Jews were without fault. No one could find something in their life to point the finger of blame. They were godly. So John had a vision of the 144,000 Jews. God rescued them, saved them, and sent them on a mission of rescue. But number two, John had a vision of the martyrs in heaven. Letter A, there's a multitude of people standing before the Lord in this vision. Look at verse 9. After this, there's that phrase again. I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count 
from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. And they were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. After this introduces a brand new vision. John, as I already said, is up in years alone on the island of Patmos for his testimony of the word of God and love for Christ. And he sees a vision of a crowd that, that could not be counted, an incalculable uh, crowd, innumerable crowd here, multitudes of people from every dialect, every nation, there giving praise to the Father and the Son. And, and John has got to be encouraged and refreshed by this. I would be. I get excited when I hear about one person getting saved, but I can't imagine how excited he must have been to see multitudes who became children of God. They heard the gospel, they believed, and they were spiritually rescued. And this group would no longer be persecuted because now they're in heaven standing before the throne of God. And they're wearing white robes, white the idea is brilliant and dazzling, shining, bright white clothing. The kind of clothing wore at a celebration. They had robes, long, long robes flowing down, denoting victory and, and, and holiness and righteousness and rejoicing. They had palm branches in their hands, uh, denoting celebration and deliverance. You know, at the Feast of Tabernacles, the Jews celebrated God's provisions in Leviticus 23, verse 40. And during their wilderness wanderings, they constructed booths with palm branches. You can read about it in Nehemiah 8, 15 through 17. When Jesus came into Jerusalem, they waved palm leaves and rejoiced that Jesus entered Jerusalem. But here, this heavenly crowd is waving palm branches. They are worshiping the Lord and, and rejoicing and celebrating in his presence. Let it be. There is a loud voice of praise directed to the Lord, and the multitude worshiped the Lord. Look at verse 10. And they cried out in a loud voice. None of this mammy pamby worship, right? Praise God from home on blessings. No, nah, these guys were excited. This multitude had a worship service like none, nothing we've ever heard. And with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. They're not praying for God to avenge their blood like the earlier group of martyrs were. No, they are glorifying and praising the Lord, and salvation is the theme of their worship. Look at Psalm 61, verse 1 on your notes. Let's read this one really loud, okay? Let's practice for heaven. Are you ready? The first word. Shout with joy to God, all the earth. Sing glory. Make his praise glorious. Let's do the next verse. Now we got practice in there. Let's do verse 1 of Psalm 100. Ready? Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness and come before him with joyful songs. Amen? This multitude worshiped the Lord. Secondly, this heavenly host joined in worshiping the Lord. All the angels, verse 11, were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God. Countless angels that cannot be numbered, thousands upon thousands and ten times, uh, ten thousand times ten thousands, what Revelation 5, 11 says. In other words, you can't count them. And they're worshiping the Lord. They fall down on their face and worship God. And those 24 elders that were uh, that represents the church that was raptured out and up in heaven, now they're worshiping God and they're on their face. And they're, they sang a song of redemption in Revelation 5, but here they're praising God for redemption in Revelation 7. And then the four living creatures, those cherubim, those exalted order of angels are also falling uh, prostrate before God, the one and only true God who is only one worthy of worship. What do they say as they worship? Look at verse 12, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Wow. 
It should crescendo, amen? So let's just read that verse out loud together. I want you to start a little softer at verse 12, at the very start, and I want you to get louder and louder and louder, amen? Ready? Revelation 7, 12, saying, amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength and be to our God forever and ever, amen? Nothing's more exciting than being in a crowd of people who love Jesus Christ with all their heart, soul, and mind, and strength, and together they are worshiping our Lord Jesus Christ. I was in the, I don't even know what they call it, some big theater down in Kentucky, Louisville. The Yum Center? Something like that. And there's this guy that was playing a piano, He, one piano, sitting right in the middle, he had thousands and thousands of, of servants, pastors, and, and, and servants of the Lord just sitting in this room that was packed. And he's just playing one praise after another. There wasn't a dry eye in the place. But to listen to the, the beautiful music, just a simple piano, and worshiping the Lord together, I'll never forget it. But I can't begin to imagine what heaven's going to be like. And we get to be there forever, amen, and worship our Lord. And we'll be there in this scene. We'll be there worshiping Jesus Christ. In the middle of this wonderful time of worship and praise to the Heavenly Father and to Jesus Christ the Lamb, let us see. There are some questions presented to John. Verse 13, then one of the elders asked me, these in white robes, who are they? And where do they come from? John says, I answered, sir, you know. The elder said, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. The elder knew the answer. John didn't know. But the intent of the elder's question was to give the answer. so, So that John would know the future readers like us would understand as we read John's record. These are the martyrs out of the great tribulation, the second three and a half years of the tribulation known as the great tribulation or as Jacob's trouble. A time that is more intense than the first three and a half years, a time that includes those seven trumpet and seven bowl judgments. The number of martyrs will grow exponentially during this time. And Jesus described this great tribulation in Matthew 24, 21, when he, when he said, For then there will be great distress, unequal from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. These persecuted believers will not take the mark nor worship the beast or his image, and as a result, they will lose their head. Because of the testimony they had for Jesus Christ. They love the Lord so much, even more than their very life. They washed their robes and made them white. Those dazzling bright robes that symbolize victory and emphasize righteousness and holiness. Ephesians 1 7 says, In him, in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. Letter D, there are some wonderful promises given to these martyrs. Look at the first one. God will be with them and protect them. Verse 15, therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in this temple. And he who sits on the throne will spread his tent over them By the way, the word used for serve here describes priestly service. These martyred believers will serve God continuously. Now, right, there's currently a temple in heaven. During the millennial reign of Christ, there'll be a temple here on earth. Ezekiel 40 through 48 talks about that temple. And after the millennial reign of Christ, during the eternal state, the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. Amen? Of Revelation 21, verse 22. But anyways, they'll be in the presence of the Lord, and Jesus, and the Lord will spread his tent over them. By the way, the word for tent, some translations have the word tabernacle. 
These martyr believers will be in the presence of the Lord. And that little verb tent there is also used in John 1.14, which reads, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. Dwelling or literally means pitch His tent among us. God will be with them. God will protect them. Number two, God will provide for them. Look at verse 16. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat upon them, nor any scorching heat. During the tribulation, especially in the great tribulation, there will be hunger, thirst, scorching heat of the sun, all these horrific things added to that, the horrible mistreatment and persecution from the Antichrist and his followers. All of that will be history. And verse 17 says, For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will lead them to springs of living water. I love this verse, Isaiah 40, verse 11. It says, He tends his flock like a shepherd, and he gathers the lambs in his arms, and he carries them close to his heart, and he gently leads those that have young. Our Lord is the great shepherd, amen? He's a lion. He's the king. He's bringing judgment. But he's the lamb. He's our shepherd. And he's gentle and kind and gracious and compassionate. Number three, he will purge all their tears. Verse 17, and God will wipe away every tear from their eye. <clears throat> this is mentioned again in Revelation 20, 21, verse 4. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. And there'll be no more death. I long for that day. Or mourning, or crying, or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. So John had a vision of 144,000 Jews saved, protected by God through the seven-year tribulation. They share the gospel. Multitudes believe and die for their faith. Both groups were rescued by God. Well, folks, how do you take this and apply it to your life today? What can you take with you today and, and apply it? First of all, I think we need to thank the Lord for his presence and protection. Amen? I mean, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Psalm 46, verse 1. He protects us every single day. Our second week of vacation, we came home. <clears throat> we decided we are going to do some work projects. Cheryl had the list. My wife, Cheryl, had the list. Paint the trim around the windows. She also had a whip. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I was painting on the side, had my ladder up lost balance. I had a paintbrush, a bucket of paint, and it's almost like slow motion. How many have ever fallen off a ladder? It's an exciting, exhilarating feeling. Went backwards and fell. I was floating through the air. Cheryl could hear me yelling outside as I went down. She came running out the front, came around to the side, and I was laying in the bushes. The bushes cushioned my fall. It was like landing on a mattress. I didn't get hurt, no injuries, no bruises, no, no sticks from the bush jabbed me or stabbed me. I laid there in the bushes, and it was little, I was just laughing. What are you going to do? The neighbors looking around, they probably saw it happen. They're laughing, you know. Rescued by the bush. But I am thankful that God is our spiritual protector. Amen. Ephesians 4.30, we're sealed to the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit is our seal, guaranteeing our inheritance to come. We also have the armor of God to protect us from spiritual attacks from the evil one, Ephesians 6. He is also our physical protector. And we can go to the Lord as our refuge and strength at any time. Let it be, thank the Lord for his provisions each and every day. This multitude in heaven will never hunger or thirst, Revelation 7, 16. Aren't you thankful that God provides for you every day? How many had breakfast this morning? How many drank coffee today? Amen. <laughs> Look at Matthew 6, 6, 31. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? Your heavenly Father knows that you need them. God will take care of your needs. 
He gave us the ability to earn income. He gave us money to buy food, purchase a car, gasoline, house, rent an apartment, whatever, a bed to sleep in. He provided family to love, friends to enjoy. He gave you a church family to serve, love, pray for, a place to worship the Lord together, not to mention he also provides spiritual strength and encouragement. And like a great shepherd, he gives us direction every day in our life and forgiveness of sins when we humble ourselves before him and repent. Thank God for his provisions. Let us see. Thank the Lord for a positive future. I'm looking forward to the day there'll be no more death. No mourning, no crying, and no pain, no sickness, no stress. One day in heaven, death, sorrow, pain will no longer be part of our vocabulary or experience. We have a future waiting for us in heaven if you know Christ is your Lord and Savior. Letter D, thank the Lord for the precious gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. You know, there's a, <clears throat> there is a, uh, a new tool for lifeguards all across America. And it's a life-saving tool. It is a remote-controlled drone that flies over the, the pool that the lifeguard is watching, and it monitors the waters. At any given moment, it might drop a rescue kit by the swimmer that's in trouble, and as soon as this kit hits the water it instantly inflates into a flotation device. It's a bright yellow horseshoe that has handles. And the whole point is that this thing will assist those who are watching over the safety of others who are swimming. It's a tool of rescue. It's a provision. I'm thankful this morning that our God has provided a rescue for us. Paul wrote, here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. Thank the Lord for saving your soul. Don't ever take it for granted. Be grateful and live with gratitude and worship flowing from your heart and show God how much you love him by living right. Amen? Live holy, live right, and please the Lord. And finally, tell others about the saving power of Jesus Christ. Paul and Silas were in prison praying and praising God. And all of a sudden, the walls of the prison shook. That jailer that had been listening to their testimony came running in and says, in Acts 16.30, what must I do to be saved? The guy got saved because Paul and Silas shared the gospel. His wife got saved. His, his children got saved. And next we find the guy washing the wounds of Paul, the, demonstrating the transformative power of, of saving grace right there on the spot. There are many people all over this world who need Christ. Most of us are not going to be able to do what Kaylee does and go to Japan to a foreign land thousands of miles away, and share the gospel. But folks, we can support missionaries like Kaylee and others who go in all over this world and share the gospel. We can support them and have a part in their ministry. Not only that, we can burn our light bright where we're at and share our faith with our neighbors, our co-workers, our family members, and do our best to plant the gospel seed in their life. God does the saving, Amen. But God uses us to have the impact, to, to be the messengers. We have the message in this earthen vessel. God wants us to share it. I'm going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes. With your head bowed and eyes closed, Rebecca's going to come. And, and let me just ask this question. Is there anybody here today, say, Pastor Dan, if I were to die this day, I do not know for sure that heaven would be my home. God bless you. God bless your honesty. Anybody else say, Pastor Dan, I do not know for sure that if I were to die today that I'd go to heaven. But I want to know. I want to know how heaven can be my home. Anybody else? 
those that raised your hand, I want you to understand that Jesus died for all of your sins. He paid for them once and for all with his precious blood. He came out of that grave three days later. And those who by faith reach out and trust in Jesus Christ and repent of their sins, God will save them, forgive their sins, and give them a home in heaven. Right now, with your head bowed and eyes closed, those who raise your hand, if you're watching online today, you would like to invite Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. You want to live to be with him in heaven one day? Would you pray with me this prayer? This prayer doesn't save you, but it's, it's faith in Jesus, in Jesus alone, that will save you. Here's the prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I know I'm a sinner. And I know because of my sins, I deserve hell. That's what I deserve. But I believe, Jesus, that you came to this world for the purpose of dying for the world and for me. I believe you paid for all of my sins on that cross. I believe you came out of that grave three days later. I believe that. And by faith this morning, I invite you, Jesus, into my life. I ask you to forgive my sins and, and please save me. And from this day forward, I give you the care and the control of my life. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Dear believer, can we just give thanks to the Lord for saving us? Right where you're seated, just worship him. Worship the Lord, thank Him for His provisions, His protection. Thank Him for His great salvation. Thank Him for a, a wonderful future in heaven with the Lord. Thank you for the privilege to serve God, the privilege to share the gospel message. Let's give Him thanks. Let's give Him praise. Let's ask Him for help to carry out the mandate He's given each of us. I'm going to ask you to stand where you're seated. Let's all stand together, please. We're going to sing Rescue the Perishing, but I want you to think about the day that God rescued you. And let gratitude and thanks in your heart. Give thanks to the Lord for his rescue. We'll look up here on the screen. We'll just sing it together, okay? I don't have the words for that, Dan. Okay. Well, let's try to do our best. Brian, why don't you come up here? <laughs> come on up, brother. You think I was kidding, don't you? I think I can lead him through, but maybe if I have you with me, we can lead him together. Amen? No, I didn't. This was a spur of the moment deal here, okay? Now the mic doesn't work. Oh, hold on. We have electricity. <laughs> let's sing it to the lord amen and, and and worship god isn't it great to come to church we can laugh amen but we can worship god and, and, and let our love and gratitude for him overflow ready now i have the words ready rescue the perishing care for the dying snatch them from come on man look at the word for the erring one, lift up the fallen, snatch them and taste the mighty truth. I know the chorus, ready? Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Why don't you lead us in the next verse, Rebecca? <laughs> Rescue 
the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful. Jesus will save. Amen. Amen. Well, <clears throat> amen. Hey, I'm, just a couple quick things here. I, my mic is cutting out on me here, but a couple quick things here. We have a VBS meeting right here in the front, uh, right after the service today. Don't forget the, the meet and greet out here in the lobby for Kaylee. Hang around for some walking tacos, get a chance to meet her, and if you have questions for her, you can do that. Ladies, there's Bible study uh, Thursday, 2.30 to 4.30 here at the church, 6.30 to 8.30 at Kathy Martinson's home. There's a Wednesday Bible study here at the church at 7. And VBS, hey, get your children signed up. Your kids need to be registered. Get them registered. Don't wait uh, until the day of because we are trying to plan food. We're going to have meals each night, and so we need to know for planning purposes. So please don't forget to register your children. Mike? Amen. Amen, Mike. How many have been praying for Janet? Raise your hand. A lot of people have been praying for her. God is answering prayers, and God is all powerful with me. And we thank the Lord for that. God bless you, folks. It is so good to be back. I really miss Grace Church. We love you guys, and it's just a blessing to be here. You have a great day. God bless you.